Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of joy, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I am so blessed in King Jesus not because of what I'm experiencing in this life, not because of what I have in this life, but because all of my joy is placed upon who Jesus is and what he does and is going to do for his people when he returns and we reign forever with him. And that should bring joy to our hearts, friends. Well, we're going to begin a series today called what the Bible says about, and then we're going to choose a topic. The reason for this is we live in a world of many different religions. And unfortunately, a lot of the religions in the world today have blended with the idea of Christianity. And you would be surprised at the amount of people who call themselves Christians. We're told by statistics that 70% of America claim to be Christian. Now, of course, you and I know that that is not accurate because to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus, we must abide by the principles of his word, the teachings that he gave us. And so when you align that with many of the people who call themselves Christians, they fell miserably in doing what the Lord has commanded. They live for this world and all this world has to offer them. And as true followers of Jesus, we know that that just is not so. But in this blending together of all these different religious ideas, you would be surprised at the amount of people who do call themselves Christians and yet they do not know yet, nor do they hold to the tenets of Christian faith. And so what I want to do is a series over the next several months where we're going to address each Christian topic. Now we're going to begin, obviously, with the most important being Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Trinity, the Word of God. But then I want to talk about some more basic ideas of Christianity that have moved their way into the church and yet are not represented in, in Scripture. And we're going to discuss topics such as baptism, tithe paying, speaking in tongues, once saved, always saved, and other topics that are important for us to understand from a biblical perspective what the Bible says and how we are to believe as followers of the Lord Jesus. Well, with that being said, today I want to address a very important topic probably the most important topic, I want to discuss who Jesus is. So I want you to grab your Bible because you're going to need your Bible. We're going to look at a lot of different texts today. But I want you to grab your Bible and I want us to begin in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. And the reason I want to begin in Galatians is because Paul is speaking to the Galatian church. And in chapter 3 verse 1 he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Now that word bewitched is interesting because in the Greek it means charmed or deceived. Who has appeared to you as a wolf in sheep's clothing, telling you what tickles your ears, what you may want to hear, what seems delightful to you, and yet does not align itself with the teachings of Scripture? So who has bewitched you? that you would not obey the truth. Now in the Greek, the word obey there not only means to be obedient, but more specifically, it means to trust, to be confident, and to believe. And be confident is interesting because as we read the word of God, we're to place all our confidence in what the Bible teaches us, not in what man teaches us, not in what man says. Because as human beings, it's so easy for us to be misled, for us to be deceived, for us to be charmed, as the text says. And this is a stinging rebuke that Paul is giving to the Galatian church here. 
And this is a stinging rebuke for us today as the people of God in 2018. So let's read it like this. O foolish Christian, who has bewitched you and charmed you that you would not trust in confidently the truth? Now, what is the truth? Well, that's an important question. Jesus told us, in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. So the Bible that you have before you from Genesis to Revelation, that is the truth. And that is what we are to place all our confidence in. And so as we're going to see over the next many months, there are a lot of things that we may believe, but we may find and discover that the Bible says absolutely the opposite. And so let's begin today with the most important question asked in Scripture. If you'll turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 16, let's begin at verse 13. Now we're told Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said unto him, Some say you are John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus said unto them, Whom do you say that I am? That, friend, is the most important question posed to us in all of Scripture. Well, of course, we know the rest of the story. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Now, when Peter says, You are the Christ, Remember, he doesn't have a New Testament to refer to. He's basing his belief upon the teachings of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the Christ is the anointed one, the promised one that we're told about in Genesis 3.15 and all the way through the remainder of the Old Testament, that Jesus is the promised one that there is one coming who will redeem his people, God's people, from their sins. And he is the promised one, the anointed one. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14, we read, Therefore the Lord himself, now when it says the Lord, this is speaking of Jehovah, the Almighty, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we know from the New Testament that Emmanuel means God with us. We're told that in the early chapters of the book of Matthew. But here in the Hebrew, the word Emmanuel comes from the Hebrew word El, which you would identify or maybe recall Elohim, which is the name of the Almighty, the name of God. And so when it says, this son who shall be born of a virgin shall be called El, or Jehovah, or the Almighty. Now if you flip over to Isaiah chapter 9, and we begin in verse 6, it says, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Now notice this. His name will be called Wonderful. His name will be called Counselor. His name will be called the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. So the Almighty himself is going to enter into human flesh and walk among men. That's what we're told in John chapter 1. And verse 1, when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now look down at verse 14, and it says, The Word that was in the beginning, that was God, was made flesh. So the Almighty entered into human flesh, the man we know as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, again, this is important because Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? Do you simply believe that I am a great prophet? 
Do you believe that I am a great teacher? Or do you believe that I am almighty God in the flesh among humankind? Well, this is a conclusion that we must finalize within ourselves, friends. Who do we see Jesus as? You know, there are many that say there is more than one way to the Father. You could be a Buddhist, you could be a Krishna, you could be a Christian, you could be a Mormon, you could be, there's a lot of different things that you could be, but as long as you're a good person, then you'll make it to the kingdom of heaven. But that's against the message of Jesus. If you look at John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man will come unto the Father but by me. You won't make it through Allah. You won't make it through Buddha. You won't make it through any other false god that has been presented to man. The only way to the Father is through Jesus, his Son. Let's look at Acts chapter 4 in verse 12. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other. You, there is no salvation known to man among any other under heaven. And this is extremely important because in John chapter 3, verse 36, we're told that he that believeth on the Son, on the Lord Jesus, has everlasting life. And he that does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If the wrath of God abides on that person, they're not going to enter into the kingdom. Now, I know that it's more comfortable, especially when we're speaking to other people, to identify with them and accept the fact that regardless of the religion that they're serving and regardless of the beliefs that they have, as long as they're good people, they're going to enter into the kingdom. And a lot of us take this approach because we don't want to offend people. But friends, the Bible is offensive. The truth is offensive. And if we're going to call ourselves followers of the Lord Jesus, then we must believe, take confidence in his teachings. And again, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man shall ever see the Father, shall never come unto the Father, but through me. So if you're one of those people that believe there are many ways to the kingdom and it's not really important what a person believes, friend, you're in grave error and you need to consider very carefully what the Bible says on this topic. You'll remember Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. You'll obey my teachings. Well, a while ago, we, we learned that obey means to take confidence in, to believe. It's not only to participate by following the teachings of Jesus, but it's important that we believe in the teachings of Scripture. That's why Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, there were false prophets among the people. Even so, there will be false teachers among you, and they will privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And they will bring upon themselves swift destruction. Why will they have swift destruction? Because they don't believe the truth. And so Peter is warning us here that we must believe the truth. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. It's not always going to be easy to stand for the truth. That's why it's a war. But we are commanded to stand for truth and fight a good war. Look at verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. If we don't believe the teachings of Scripture the way Scripture teaches it and presents itself, we could shipwreck our faith. And so we can see here that our salvation hinges upon our beliefs. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18. He says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, 
Beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Do you sense the great warning here that Peter and Paul and Jesus are giving us in how we position ourselves in the truth of Scripture and what we must stand upon? For if we don't stand for the truth, we're like the wicked and we will fall from our own steadfastness. Look at Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. Paul says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be doomed to destruction. And having said it once, and realizing how quickly it might pass by the reader, he says, as I said before, so say I now again in verse 9. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. Is it always going to be pleasing to state the truth in a conversation? No, but if we don't, then we're not the followers of Jesus Christ. That's what the passage tells us here in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. So the question then is exactly what Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Well, let's look at a few verses as we close on what the Bible says about who Jesus is. Now, we already looked at Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and chapter 9 verse 6. And from those passages, we can see that a son has been promised to be born from a virgin and that son shall be called God, the Almighty. But let's look at John chapter 10 and verse 33. Now, this is interesting because a lot of people will argue the idea that Jesus is truly God and that he never claimed to be so. But look at verse 33. It says, the Jews answered Jesus saying, for a good work, we stone you not, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. You'll see this also in chapter five, verse 18. But the interesting thing is, is that the Jewish leaders are telling Jesus, because you claim to be God, but you're a man, that's blasphemy, and therefore that's why we desire to stone you. So scripture is very clear here that Jesus did claim to be God in the flesh, exactly as Isaiah 7, 14 and Isaiah 9, 6 predicted he would be. Look at John chapter 20. And let's begin at verse 26. It says, after eight days, his disciples were within. Now, Jesus appeared to the disciples after his resurrection, and Thomas was not there. Later, the disciples told Thomas about Jesus' visit, and Thomas did not believe. And so it picks up with the story, and it says, after eight days, after that first event, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them this time. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Now, Thomas had said the only way he would believe if he, if he could stick his hand in the side of, of where Jesus was wounded and he could put his finger in the holes where Jesus was nailed to the cross. And Jesus, knowing this, says to Thomas in verse 27, reach hither thy finger, Thomas, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now that word comes in the Greek from the Greek word theos, which means almighty God. So Thomas, along with the other disciples, are recognizing Jesus as the Almighty, especially after his resurrection, and he's proven himself to be so. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 
It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The Almighty was manifest in the flesh. And as we saw from John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14, that the Almighty entered into flesh and walked among men. Let's look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God. And if you're using the King James Version Bible, it says, and, but interestingly, that word and is not in the original Greek text. So it would read like this, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, the anointed one, the promised Christ, the Messiah, he is almighty God in the flesh, and he is the only way to the Father. He is the only way we'll ever make heaven our home, and we must not only believe that, but we must teach it, and we must stand upon it as undeniable truth. Look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 33. It says, then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying unto him, of a truth, thou art the son of God. Notice they worshiped him. Now keep that in mind. And let's look also at Matthew 28 and verse nine. It says, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hell. And they come and held him by the feet, and they worshiped him. So we see very clearly that they worshiped Jesus. And according to Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14, we are told that you will worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So it was forbidden to worship any other than God Jehovah himself. And yet, here the early followers of Jesus are bowing down and worshiping him. And the only reason they could worship him as Jews, and the only reason that he would allow it as a Jew, is because he is almighty God, deserving of such worship. And finally, if there's any doubt at up, up to this point as to who Jesus claimed to be, who Jesus is, who you must present him as and believe him to be. Let's finish with Revelation chapter 21 and let's look at verse six. Now, if you're in the King James Version and you have a red letter edition, you're gonna notice that these words are not red letter, they're black, but they should be red letter. Let me show you what I mean. Revelation 21 verse six. It says, he said unto me, it is done. Now, who is the he that it's speaking of? Well, if you'll back up one verse in verse five, it says, he that sat upon the throne said. So the person that's speaking to John is he that sits upon the throne. Well, obviously it is the almighty that is sitting upon the throne, but it's Jesus himself. Because in verse six, he says, he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, this is important because if you if you go to Revelation 22, one chapter forward, and you look at verse 13 in red letters, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And this is the Lord Jesus speaking here. So again, Revelation 21, verse 6 I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And this I is the one who sits upon the throne in verse five. And then in chapter 22, verse 13, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse six, we're told, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel. This is Jehovah and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. This is the Lord Jesus. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. So going back to our original text in Galatians chapter 3 
in verse 1, we see the importance of what it means not to be charmed, not to be bewitched, not to fall among the rest of the world in believing what seems so comfortable, what tickles our ears. But we must stand upon the truth and we must be willing to tell everyone involved in any other religion with great care, great kindness, great patience, and great love, regardless of their efforts, if they do not come through the Lord Jesus, they will never enter. The message of Jesus is very inclusive. That's why they hate him so much. And when we present that message, the truth to the world around us, we can expect the exact same hatred, friends. But even though the hatred, the persecution, the ridicule, and the insults follow, we must stand upon the truth as the Word of God presents it. And it is my hope and belief that today, based upon the, the evidence that, that's been presented in this study, that you will come to the conclusion that Jesus is the way, the only way. He is the truth, the only truth. And he is the life, the only life. And it is only through him and what he has taught us in his word that we will ever enter into the kingdom. And what we believe is of utmost importance because if we drift from the belief of scriptures, we place our own salvation in jeopardy because as we were told, this could be the shipwreck of our faith. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and we're going to be tackling other topics that are of great importance throughout our times together in the future. But it is my prayer that as you seek to be a loyal follower of the Lord Jesus, that you will stand upon the truth of God's word as the only truth, the absolute standard for truth, and that everything you believe will be derived from the Holy Scriptures, which is where we must base our lives. Because Jesus said again in John 17, 17, Thy word, O God, is truth. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you spent a few moments with us today. I pray that these passages have helped concrete your faith in what you believe and what you hold dear, and that you'll continue to strive to be the most faithful follower of the Lord Jesus that you possibly can be. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I truly love you. Remember to read your Bibles today. I'll see you on the next video.